Hello, I am Dr. Joe Albano, and we're here for the inaugural episode of our podcast, Live Better Without Surgery is what we call it. And the purpose of the podcast is just to educate people on regenerative orthopedics and also how you can have better outcomes with regenerative orthopedics and anything to optimize their health. So pretty broad spectrum of topics that we're gonna have here. So today on this first one, uh, we're gonna talk about meniscal surgeries. And a lot of people have these surgeries. I mean, I was trained in an allopathic model. I am an MD, a medical doctor. So I was trained in this model. And you just see a lot of people getting surgeries, knee surgeries, if they have a, a torn meniscus and they get counseled on a steroid shot maybe some physical therapy if that doesn't work get surgery and today we're going to go through this uh, topic and i call it the terrible horrible no good very bad meniscus surgery you kind of get where i'm going with this thing here okay so we're going to go through this this is a lecture that I gave uh, in March at the American Academy of Orthopedic Medicine conference. And I won't do everything I did there, but you'll get the idea of uh, why we might not want to have meniscal surgery where we trim up the meniscus by the time we're done with this. So that is the goal. I have nothing financially to disclose. Jerry Malanga was an awesome doctor and friend and he gave me a bunch of these slides after he gave a lecture at uh, the Orthobiologic Institute Kobe lecture a number of years ago and he was absolutely lambasted by uh, the audience and a particular surgeon in there and he stood his ground though and presented a bunch of the similar data and so I asked Jerry afterwards, after saying, oh, Jerry, awesome job. You did so well with that and standing up for just presenting the data. And I asked him for his slides and he gave me a bunch of them. And so I have given him the credit uh, for these slides that uh, I had obtained from Jerry. So Jerry, this is dedicated to you. Okay, so who's old enough to remember Calvin and Hobbes. So Calvin, for those of you who don't know, was this five-year-old precocious little boy who has this stuffed tiger that comes to life whenever he's alone. But if he is with other people, he goes back to being a stuffed tiger and they have all these adventures together. And so Calvin's here on a slang sa swing saying, hey, it's not denial. I'm just very selective about the reality I accept. And that reminds me, Dr. Paul Fleissner had said at a lecture, we were both lecturing at uh, Nemecolon one time together, and he said, nothing spoils good results like long-term follow-up. So we're going to look at that and see how that relates to meniscal tears here. We're going to briefly talk about meniscal anatomy, some typical meniscus treatment, arthroscopic partial meniscectomy, that versus physical therapy or even sham surgery. And then what can we do if surgery is not the best option? Maybe some PRP, fat, do we need ultrasound guidance? So we're gonna look at all those things. Bill Watterson was the guy who created Calvin and Hobbes and he is the master of thinking outside of the box for lots of reasons. And so he is quoted as saying, who is the guy who first looked at a cow and said, I think I'll drink whatever comes out of these when I squeeze them. And if you can see my slides, I have a box that is in the lower right hand corner. It says transmogrifier. So that's Calvin's transmogrifier. So he could become anything he wanted. So he wanted to become a dinosaur, he'd become a dinosaur. And so Bill is definitely thinking outside of the box here. And that's what we want to do too. We want to think outside of the box when it comes to traditional medical treatments. So with a meniscal tear, let's talk about a particular case. <clears throat> so we have an active 52-year-old woman who likes to play tennis. She has this medial knee pain, got some x-rays, they're normal. MRI and or ultrasound shows a medial meniscal tear. And she wants to get back to playing tennis as soon as possible. And 
Our goal is to find the best way to achieve her goal and faster if possible. Here's a slide that says essentially uh, that meniscal tears are common and often incidental. So this is a study by Martin England and it pretty much says that, yeah, we can just have these asymptomatic tears if we're going to get imaging studies. So we have to be careful how we interpret these things. And he also looks at particular patterns of meniscal tears and radial tears are highly relevant in the progression of osteoarthritis. Let's explain what that means. So if you can't see this and you're just listening, basically <laughs> meniscus is basically there's, there's medial lateral meniscus and they're pretty much C-shaped and there's fibers going in different directions, uh, radially, circumferentially, and it gives it strength in different directions. And this is a great slide if you can see it. I love this because it shows the blood supply of the meniscus. It's coming from laterally and it comes from the superior and inferior geniculate artery, uh, which comes from the popliteal artery. And the blood supply goes from outside to inside and it doesn't reach all the way inside. And we term these things uh, based on how much blood supply they have. The outside is red, red, the middle is red, white, and the inside is white, meaning you can't see any blood in there. So better healing propensity in the lateral, more peripheral side of the meniscus, I should say. And as you get closer inside, there's less likelihood that it's going to heal well. There's surgical techniques where they can go in and try and uh, sew together the meniscus to get it to heal, especially in the periphery that might work. And there was an article that I found when I was researching for this presentation, uh, there are different techniques. And with one of the techniques an outside in technique of the surgery, what they did is they found that they had a higher propensity for tying off one of these arteries that gave the blood supply to the meniscus. So it doesn't seem like it's a great idea to me if we need the blood supply to help heal a meniscus. And so the findings in that study was that you should use this inside out technique and there's less risk of that happening. But blood supply is really important in here. Here's a slide of the different types and the radial type is here on the bottom of the slide. It's this one right here. So basically it's a tear that goes from inside to the outside or peripheral side of the meniscus. And if you have a bucket handle tear, this is a longitudinal vertical circumferential tear or bucket handle tear. And those uh, are or can be uh, surgically repaired. It just doesn't work that well, but that's a common one that will be surgically repaired. Usually with these other ones, they go in and trim it up so that there's no rough edges or free edges on that. How do these things heal? Well, it depends. There's a lot of things that affect healing. Where it is, the location, how big it is, which kind it is. We just said the radial type of tear is maybe not the best one because it's highly relevant to progression of arthritis. How long has it been since the injury? Is it yesterday? Is it 10 years ago? How old is the person? Are you 90? Are you 30? all these things are going to matter. If there's going to be healing, you can have spontaneous healing in the red red zone where there's more blood supply, but poor healing in the other zones, and especially if it's more than a centimeter in length. Another interesting thing with meniscal tears is there is an inflammatory environment associated with these meniscal tears. So you have increased interleukin-1 beta, interleukin-6, interleukin-8, TNF-alpha, and these things will lead to cartilage degeneration, inflammation of the synovium, and then progression to arthritis. And one of the things we would want to do is change this pro-inflammatory environment so that it's more anti-inflammatory, and that will be helpful in the knee environment. Here is a slide where 
it presents three things that are necessary for healing. First, you got to have a scaffold, which can be native tissue, or I really like to use fat adipose. It acts as a great scaffold. They even have a paper on that that's out there. You also need signal proteins and adhesion molecules. So that's platelet-rich plasma, which you get from the blood, it are things that can provide these signal proteins and adhesion molecules. They help recruit cells to the scaffold to get healing. And then once these cells are there, they will divide and multiply in there. And the third thing you need, in addition to scaffold signal proteins, undifferentiated cells, stem cells. And those could be ones you put in there with fat or bone marrow, or they can be signaled by PRP to come to the area. So you're gonna need those three things in any healing environment. What is the usual treatment of meniscal tears? Conservative is always a good way to go. Physical therapy, anti-inflammatories. Although if you listen to us at all, you know that anti-inflammatory medications are not good for healing. They prevent healing, in fact, and they can lead to other things. There can be cardiovascular side effects with it and GI side effects are just not good. They are good at providing some pain relief, which is why people take it take those kind of medications, but just not good for healing. So wouldn't recommend doing any anti-inflammatories. Other thing is relative rest, meaning if it hurts you running, but you can bike ride, bike ride, don't run. Steroid injections are also bad, similar to anti-inflammatories. They will not help healing at all. They will prevent healing. So you want to avoid those at all costs because they not only can prevent healing, but they'll also damage the cartilage that's in there already and progress arthritis if you have it or cause arthritis even. So you want to avoid steroid injections. Not a good thing to do. And then surgical. That's what we're talking about here. So debridement is this arthroscopic partial meniscectomy. That's commonly what's done. You could also have some thing called rasping. It's not done very often, but they kind of rough up the edges or they can repair the meniscus. So I'll just say meniscectomy instead of arthroscopic partial meniscectomy, but that is what I'm talking about. So people nowadays, you know, surgeons know not to take out the whole meniscus. Unlike when I was in high school, I remember my neighbor, Nikki, he tore his meniscus playing football and they just took the whole thing out. Like, ah, you don't need it, you'll be good. And, you know, not too long later, 15, 20 years later, gets bad arthritis in the knee. So we know not to do that anymore. So when I say meniscectomy, I mean partial meniscectomy, and it's done via arthroscope. This is the gold standard for treatment of these uh, tears. Lots of them are done, over 700,000 a year in the U.S. alone. And why are they done when randomized controlled trials, meta-analyses show that there's no long-term benefit, and we're going to go over some of those studies. And it's, it's worse than that, because after you get a meniscectomy, you have 100% increased contact stress in the medial compartment, 300% increase in the lateral compartment, and six-fold increased risk of future arthritis and three times risk of future total knee replacement. So not good things happen with this. So let's go over some studies comparing meniscectomy versus physical therapy. There's four studies here. This one is surgery versus PT for meniscal tear and osteoarthritis by Jeff Katz. And this was in 2013. Multicenter randomized controlled trial. People over 45 had symptoms consistent with a meniscal tear for one month, not one year, one month. So that's pretty short. I wouldn't be recommending in a normal, non-professional athlete doing anything aggressive. They've only had symptoms for one month, but that's what they looked at here. So they also had some mild to moderate arthritis, 351 patients. They randomized them to either surgery and physical therapy or just physical therapy alone. They followed them with Womack out to six and 12 months. And what did they show? There was no significant difference in the functional status between these two groups at six and 12 months. So no difference basically. 
and that's 12 months. Okay, so what happens if you take it out to two years? Is there going to be a difference? Well, here's one by Ji Hyun Kim, if I can say that right, Comparative Study of Meniscectomy and non optimal Treatment for Degenerative Horizontal Tears of the Medial Meniscus. So here was another randomized controlled trial. It was in 2013 in AJSM, 102 patients, degenerative meniscal tears that were horizontal, average age was about 54, 50 surgery, 52 non-op treatment. And what happened here? Basically, there was no difference in the two groups. So one year and two years, you don't see a difference between physical therapy and the meniscectomy group. Okay, well, what about looking at a systematic review or qualitative synthesis? So, so just a bigger, more robust study. Here's one in 2018 looking at meniscectomy versus PT for degenerative meniscus. And what does it show here? No compelling evidence to support meniscectomy versus PT. So what about people who had more of mechanical symptoms, because that's a common one. We say, oh yeah, okay, well, you can get away without doing surgery unless you have mechanical symptoms like locking, clicking, uh, things like this. And here's a study that is from 2022, effective PT versus partial meniscectomy in people with degenerative meniscal tears. And it's by Nordun. And this one, oh, sorry, I, I jumped ahead of myself here. This one was just for longer follow-up. This was the five-year follow-up study, and this one showed no difference. So this one wasn't the um, one with the mechanical symptoms. But if you follow them out for 12 months, 24 months, five years, there's no difference between meniscectomy and PT. Um, actually, no, I'm, I stand corrected. This was the one, too, that had the one uh, with... Uh, the physical symptoms and the mechanical symptoms. So there was no difference with that. How about sham surgery? Well, here's three studies looking at that. Well, what is sham surgery? So sham surgery is when you have a trial. Some people get the treatment, partial meniscectomy. Some people don't get the treatment partial meniscectomy, but they think they did. So the surgeons make a decision and kind of pretend to do the procedure of patients asleep, right? So they don't know what's going on. And uh, they don't really do the procedure, but there's an incision the patient thinks they have it. And so here's one. This was randomized, multi-center, double-blind, sham controlled trial, 146 patients, more than three months of symptoms. And Patients had symptoms consistent with the uh, meniscal tear and no arthritis, and they were randomized to surgery or the sham group. And basically this one said, yep, partial meniscectomy was not superior to sham surgery. And if you can see the slides here, the ones on the right are looking at different outcome scores, which show this. So there's pain scores and these Womack scores, Lysholm scores, they're no better. Well, how about a degenerative meniscal tear in here too? With this one, uh, so this is by Sivanen, and this first one was also by Sivanen. This second study right here now shows that they just followed up those patients from the first study. That one was for a year. This one is a two-year follow-up, and there's no difference after two years either. So you thought, hey, maybe somebody would have improvement after a year? Nope, they don't. No difference. Okay. Here's now I'm getting to the one with the mechanical symptoms. So ignore what I said before about the mechanical symptoms. This is the one I was thinking of. So here's one. It's the sham surgery study looking at mechanical symptoms and partial meniscectomies in patients with a degenerative meniscal tear. And so this is a Sivanen study again. And Basically, this one showed the same thing with mechanical symptoms. There was no benefit over sham surgery to relieve these mechanical symptoms of catching and locking. So, no difference. How about if you go to a systematic review and meta-analysis for this? 
And basically, this is a study here by Kahn that says, nope, there's no benefit to debridement for degenerative meniscal tears compared with non-op or sham treatments. So, no better. Here's my buddy Calvin again. Okay, so again, for those who cannot see this, Calvin's there standing with Hobbs looking at a snowball and says, look at this. This is the biggest snowball in the world. See, we can plaster somebody with it. And then Hobbs kind of ruins his day and says, how are you going to pick it up? And Calvin just falls on the ground and says, reality continues to ruin my life. And Hobbs says, maybe you could put it somewhere, someplace where someone will walk into it. Again, reminds me of Dr. Fleissner saying, nothing spoils good results like long-term follow-up. So that's what we just saw. If you look at these studies critically, long-term follow-up shows there's no difference between partial meniscectomy surgery and physical therapy or sham surgery. No difference, yet we still continue to do these surgery commonly. And oh wait, it's even worse than that. Who cares there's no difference? Well. It's worse because you're going to have a 100% increase in the contact stress in the medial compartment, 300% in the lateral compartment, six-fold increase risk of future arthritis, and three times the risk of future knee replacement. And those are not good. I don't want to have those things in my knee. So why do we keep doing it? Could it be that it's generating a lot of money? Just throwing that thought out there. Who's making the money? I have a lot of surgeon friends and they're really good doctors and really good guys. And they're not making a lot of money doing this. Who's making the money? Regardless, something for you to ponder that thought. We can discuss that over beverages one time. But it doesn't seem like it's the right way to do things is to have this partial meniscectomy. Yet we still keep doing more of them. Here's an article by Monk, Urgent Need for Evidence in Arthroscopic Meniscal Surgery. And it's showing that we just keep doing more and more of these things. England, Scotland, Denmark, Australia. I go back to the three things we need to have healing, scaffold, signal proteins, undifferentiated cells. We need all three of those things if we're gonna have a better way of doing this. So here is a study by my friend Brad Fullerton, and it was in 2016 when it came out. Basically, it's a 43-year-old man, had a bucket handle meniscal tear. He did three treatments of PRP in and around the meniscus. Guy had no pain uh, with walking at eight months after the injury. By 10 months, the MRI showed complete resolution of the meniscal tear. So we know that according to Brad's study here, that this can work even just with PRP. And there are other things stronger, like fat, like bone marrow. Here's a paper that talks about the role of mesenchymal stem cells in tissue engineering of the meniscus by Zellner. And basically what he's saying in there is you need these MSCs to um, heal the defect in the avascular zone. So especially the white or red white zones, what he's talking about. And you can still see these things in there six weeks after you put them in, the MSCs. And the response of these MSCs is not solely related to these growth factor relief release, but there can be some intrinsic repair that may be going on in there. I love this study here. So this one is by Zellmer. He did, it's called Stem Cell Based Tissue Engineering for Treatment of Meniscal Tears in the Avascular Zone. If you can't see this, uh, I'll describe it, but the picture is worth a thousand words. So basically what he did is he took little white New Zealand bunny rabbits and created meniscal defect in there. And in one group A, he did no treatment and the images of the meniscus show that, yeah, it's not, nothing happened, it's not healed. Group B, he did this all inside technique repairing the meniscus and it doesn't look a whole lot different from group A that had nothing done. Group C had hyaluronic acid and collagen plus PRP and that looks better but it's still a, a tear is in there. Group D hyaluronic acid collagen plus bone marrow MSCs and that one looks a bit better than group C and then 
group E is highly ironic acid, collagen, and cultured MSCs. And that one looks the best of all of them. And then group F is a control, which was just highly ironic acid, collagen, and it looks no different than the group with no treatment. So this one's showing that, yeah, cultured MSCs can really help with a meniscal tear. In fact, it looks normal. So other things can work besides partial meniscectomy. But can you really get these cells to the site? How are you going to do that? Well, ultrasound is a great tool. Here's a Jay Smith article, sonographically guided knee meniscus injections, feasibility techniques and validation. And basically it's showing, yep, you can get it there. And it is not difficult to do that as long as you know how to use ultrasound and you can get the needle in the right place. But if you're not using ultrasound, you're not getting there. Okay, here is some real world data, part of this group called Data Biologics, and I accessed the database. So it's, uh, what is this? It's an outcomes database, so where we can track all of our patients. So my patients individually, and I can see Joe Smith and on this day, how he's progressed and you follow him with these outcome scores. But I can also access other physicians' data on there. And I don't know who they are, so it's anonymous. I don't know the patients, but I can see what has been done. And so I did this on February 24th, 2024, and looked at this for meniscal tear. So here is just how many treatments have been done with PRP. You can see 234 of them with bone marrow, 55, with fat, 46 have been uh had data collected from this database and then this one shows how long people were followed and with prp 52 percent were followed for more than 12 months and less for the other time frames with bone marrow 60 percent over 12 months with fat 66 percent over 12 months so significant number have been followed for a significant amount of time you don't want just want to follow these people for a month and see how they do well they're not going to be feeling better in a month you need to follow them at least for four six 12 months bare minimum 12 months is better 24 is even better five years is even better than that so let's look at some of the real world data here what it shows this is numeric pain rating so scale of one to ten how bad is your pain ten is the worst pain ever and you can see on here so there's three different treatments there's blood base which is prp or different variations of that bone marrow and fat and all three of these have good results at three months six months you can see the blood base ones start to have increased pain at about six months going to 12 months 18 months maybe a little bit less at 24 months the bone marrow group does well at 18 months has a little bit of spike uh, actually sorry the bone marrow group we only have data out to 12 months so it's uh good out to 12 months it's the fat group that had a little bit of spike at 18 months and then significantly less pain at 24 months so it just keeps getting better overall regardless bone marrow fat prp all of these things can decrease pain for meniscal tears. What have I been doing? Well, I've been doing this since 2007. We do this rasping equivalent where I take an 18 gauge needle and fenestrate the tear, go around where the tear is using ultrasound to directly guide it to the right place, make sure I'm in there. And you can feel the difference with this too. It's really interesting. So normal tissue meniscus, feels like you're pulling dart out of a dartboard, but if you have a tear, it doesn't feel like that. It can feel like you're sticking a knife in butter or warm butter or a hot knife in butter. It just goes through it really easily. So that's a feeling you get with these meniscal tears. And then we like to use fat. Fat is such a good source of mesenchymal stem cells and it also acts as a scaffold and we use it with prp and or bone marrow depending on how bad the tear is with bone marrow you get a little bit different kind of stem cells in there and what i've noticed too though sometimes with some people even with complete resolution of clinical symptoms they can 
have the tear visible on an MRI, like I've done this in one patient I'm thinking in particular, totally asymptomatic, doing everything in the world. We got an MRI for another reason down the road after a year. And you could still see a bit of a meniscal tear in there, but they were asymptomatic. This may have something to do with that other slide where we're talking about the inflammatory environment in the knee, where the fat, bone marrow, PRP, whatever it is you're using, is creating an anti-inflammatory environment there. And that may have something to do with this. So here's Jerry Moanga's paper, clinically eval of microfragmented adipose tissue as a treatment option for patients with meniscal tears with arthritis, prospective pilot study. So this paper was uh, published in October of 2020. So we'll just go over some of the paper here. It's a really great paper. So it was non-randomized at one single site. It was prospective, 20 patients. They had meniscal symptoms. MRI showed a meniscus tear. And they failed conservative treatment and followed him up for 12 months. So what did he see? Here's pain basically went baseline from 5.45 to 12 months pain of 2.2. So pain definitely decreased there. Here's a slide looking at Coos subscales. So this is one of the validated outcome scores and basically depends on which one you're looking at. And if you can't see the slide, it's, it's showing Considerable improvement, not 100% improvement, but considerable improvement on this. And curiously, he looked at this and found there were two groups of people. There were responders and non-responders. So if he broke them out, people had even better results. So again, no treatment works for everybody 100% of the time. Never, ever, ever, ever. So he found that here too, so it's not a big surprise. The people who didn't respond, they didn't respond, they didn't do well. And when he broke out the responders, they just had more significant improvement if you took out the people who just didn't get better. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. Conclusions here, meniscal tears are a common source of knee pain. Arthroscopic partial meniscectomy is the gold standard of treatment despite it being no better than PT or sham surgery. And oh wait, it's worse because you can have 100% increase contact stress in the medial compartment, 300% in the lateral, six-fold increased risk of getting arthritis in the future, three-fold increased risk of getting a knee replacement in the future. So it has bad effects as well. And Jerry's study showed that you can do well with fat. Brad Fullerton with PRP showed that even that can help you. So there are other options that we have out there nowadays that are better than just going with the no good, terrible, very bad arthrospo arthroscopic partial meniscectomy. All right. I am Dr. Joe Albano, and thanks for bearing with us through this. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to give our office a call. Check out our website for other information on some of the things that we do that can help you live better without surgery.